Hello, welcome to lecture 28 of ELEC Eng 2 ci file. In this lecture, I will go over AC power, how do you calculate the power for AC circuits, and I will show you that the power has two components, an average component and a time vary component. And we really care about the average component because this represents a power which is indeed delivered to the load. The other part represents the reactive power which is stored in, in capacitors and inductors. And uh, this power is, is, is usually it's oscillating with time. Um, it's, it can be positive, it can be negative because the, these components are storing energy uh, at one part of the cycle and then are giving back this energy at another part of the cycle. Okay, so we'll go over this one. And again, this part is from chapter 9 and from the pages shown here. We discussed power already for DC circuits. We know that the power is the product of the voltage and the current. If the current is flowing uh, from the positive to the negative terminals, as we was the case in DC in the DC analysis. So if you have a resistor here and there is a current I flowing this way, it's flowing from positive to negative, we say that this load um, uh, dissipates power and the power dissipated is equal to V multiplying I or V squared over R or I squared R. This was the case of DC, when there is no time variation. Now, we talk about the case where everything is sinusoidal. So, for example, here we have a source. It's a sinusoidal source. Its amplitude is AV and its angle is theta V. And this source supplies a current to a load. And this load has an impedance Z. And we can write this Z as modulus Z and an angle theta Z. Okay, so remember the impedance is a complex number. So it has a modulus and angle as well. So and the, because there is this voltage here, sinusoidal with time, a current will start to flow that's also sinusoidal with time. So if the voltage is given by this phasor, it's AV, angle theta V, which can be written in alternative form as um, AV E to the J theta V. Both of them are equivalent. Okay. Then I can simply say that the corresponding time domain quantity V of T is equal to the amplitude cosine omega t plus the angle theta v. Okay, now if you want to get the phase of the current you, here in this circuit, you see the phase of the current is equal to the voltage, phase of the voltage divided by the impedance. So I'm going to divide v, del, v tilde by z, but v is a phasor, its uh, his magnitude is av at its angle theta v, okay, and z has a modulus of z, modulus z and an angle of theta z so what I did when I did here when I divided two complex numbers I divide the two moduli and then I subtract the two angles okay so the current has a modulus this is a modulus of the current this is what we call here AI so the amplitude of the current is equal to the amplitude of the voltage divided by the modulus of the impedance and the phase of the current which we can call here theta I okay is the phase of the voltage minus the phase of the impedance, or the angle of the voltage minus the angle of the impedance. So the current in general can be written as AI cosine omega t plus theta i. Remember, AI and theta i are related to the amplitude of the voltage, the modulus of the impedance, the angle of the voltage, and the angle of the impedance. This is how we can calculate AI and theta i from AV and theta v. The power now that's, that's delivered is now a function of time. It's not like the case in DC. In the, the case of DC, everything was constant with time. Here, the power, the instantaneous power, is equal to the product of the voltage with the current. So B of T is equal to V of T multiplying I of T. Okay, so, uh, so the power delivered here is really time variable, is not constant anymore. And this is what we call the instantaneous power. It varies from one point to another. And I will show you that, that from this instantaneous power, we can see how much average power is being delivered to the load. So, the instantaneous power, as we agreed, is the product of the instantaneous voltage by the instantaneous current. This one has an amplitude EV and an angle theta V. This one has an amplitude EI and an angle theta I. When you multiply them, the product of two cosines is one half cosine the difference plus cosine the sum. So when you subtract these two angles, omega t will cancel with omega t and you obtain theta v minus theta i. When you sum these two arguments here, you get 2 omega t plus theta v plus theta i. 
So this is what we end up having. Notice that this term here, cosine theta v minus theta i, is just a number. It's not a function of time. Because this is a certain angle, maybe 45 degrees. This one maybe 10 degrees. So the difference between them is a constant. You take it as a cosine, it's a constant. You multiply by the two amplitudes, divide by two is a constant. So this is a DC term. This represents the average power. The other part here is a cosine. And it has doubled the frequency of the current and the voltage. Remember, the, the, the voltage has a frequency of omega. The current has a frequency of omega. But the power here, this part here, has a frequency of 2 omega. So this part here is sinusoidal and its average is 0. If you integrate over one complete cycle, you get an average of 0. So what's happening here, the power delivered from the load will go to two parts. This part will be dissipated in the, resist, in the resistors of the network or of the impedance that you have. And this part here represents really the energy that's being stored in the inductors and the capacitors. And you can see the power becoming positive and negative because these components are, at some instant of time, they are storing energy. At the next instant of time, they are giving back this energy. So the power can be positive or it can be negative. And that's why this is a cosine. But they don't have any average power because, as we said, the capacitors and inductors are lossless components. They do not, they do not dissipate any heat. They just store energy and then give it back. Uh, the, the capacitor stores the energy in the electric field, and the inductor stored, stores the energy in the magnetic field. So the most important thing that I want you to get out of this one is that the power is the product of AV, AI divided by 2, cosine theta V minus theta I. The amplitude of the voltage multiplying amplitude of the current divided by 2, cosine theta V minus theta I, and this is the difference between their two angles. Okay, and this is, this is just a number, okay, it's not a function of time. Um, so this is how we calculate the average power, and um, this actually can be written as well in terms of phasors, because I can simply write this one here, um, you will know about this maybe in other courses, that this is, can be written as uh, what I call the current, the RMS current multiplied by the RMS voltage conjugate, okay? So uh, what's happening here? The RMS, the RMS phasor is the same as the phasor we have, but you divide it by square root 2. So uh, so this 2 here, this 2 that we have in the, num in the numerator, we are going to divide it into square root 2 multiplying square root 2. And then we divide, we define AV divided by square root 2 at the RMS value for the, for the voltage, the amplitude of the voltage. We define AI divided by square root 2 as the RMS value of the current, okay? And when you multiply two phases together, you actually you subtract the two angles. This Remember, this one has an angle um, theta i and this angle theta v. So the conjugate of this one will have an angle minus theta v. This is a conjugate sign here. And this is how you can write it this way in terms of phasors. You multiply the current by the conjugate of the voltage, and both of them should be RMS, because the RMS will create the scale factor of one half. Anyway, you know about this more in, in advanced courses, uh, but, but this can be written in terms of phasors. Expression here can be written in terms of phasors. Okay, let's take a look at different situations. Theta V minus theta I determines the average power. If you have an inductor or you have a capacitor, you see that the difference between the angle of the voltage and the angle of the current is either pi over 2 or minus pi over 2. And really this does not matter for a cosine, because cosine pi over 2 and cosine minus pi over 2 are zeros. So this means that the average power is zero for both a capacitor and an inductor, which is expected because these components they do not dissipate any power. They store energy and then they give it back then their average power must be equal to zero, okay? But if you have a resistive load, if you have a resistive load, then if you remember, if you have a resistor, okay, you have a resistor R, and you apply it for eta voltage V tilde, then the current flowing here I tilde is nothing but V tilde over R. So the, 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 the two, the current and the voltage will have the same angle, because the resistance R does not have an angle. So here we can simply say that theta V is equal to theta I, and in that case, cosine theta v minus theta i will give us 1. It's cosine 0. And the average power is 1 half the amplitude of the voltage multiplied the amplitude of the current. 
okay so just remember there is no average power for capacitors no average power for inductors both of them have an average power of zero because the difference between the angle of the cosine and sine is either pi over 2 or minus pi over 2 for a capacitor the current leads for an inductor the voltage leads okay but if you have a resistor the current and the voltage have the same phase okay so theta i is equal to theta v then cosine theta i minus theta v will give us 1 then the average power will be given by this expression let's take a look at one example we have here an AC circuit it has inductor one inductor one capacitor two resistors we are given that the source here is sinusoidal it's 100 cosine 100 T would like to find the average power supplied by the source to find this average power as we agreed we have to find the current delivered by the source and then we know the amplitude of the voltage here we know the amplitude of the current we know the angle between them I can calculate the average power because the average power requires the two amplitudes and require the two angles okay so what I'm going to be doing here I first find the, find the input impedance looking into the circuit Zn okay and once I found it in I'm going to calculate the total current supplied by this source which is equal to Vs divided by Zn and remember Vs here is a phasor okay so I'm going to say that the current flowing here into into this circuit is equal to Vs divided by Zn and please please don't don't divide Vs of t by Zn because everything here to talk about is a phasor so you have to convert this one to a phasor of course the phasor of this one is one hang 100 angle zero Okay, we start to solve this question. Uh, we have to calculate all the impedances as we agreed. Um, first, we have to put this capacitor in, in parallel with this resistance. So I'm going to call this parallel combination here Z1. So first, I calculate the impedance of the of the of the capacitor and the impedance of the inductor. Omega is 100 radian per second because the source is cosine 100 uh, 100 t. So this omega. So Zc, Zc is 1 over J omega, J 100, 10 to the minus 3. So 10 to the minus 3 goes to the denominator as 10 to the power 3. 1 over J is minus J. So you get minus J 10 ohm. The impedance of the inductor, this is 50 milli Henry. So to J omega L, so J 100 multiplying 50, 10 to the minus 3. Uh, so uh, this will give us J 5,000 multiplying 10 to the minus 3. It will give us J 5. I'm going to combine these two together and I'm going to call them uh, Z1. So, so this combination here is called Z1 here. Okay. Uh, so this combination is nothing but um, the, uh, the 15 ohm is in parallel with Zc. 15 in parallel with Zc. So 15 multiplying minus G10 over uh, 15 um, uh, minus, this should be minus G10 here. Should be minus G10. Okay, so let me correct this one here. Okay, so I corrected that typo. Um, of course, when you put two impedances in parallel, you multiply them, the numerator, and then you divide by their sum. So this minus J10 here. And then I multiply it by the conjugate of 15 minus J10 numerator and denominator. So this becomes 15 plus J10. And the denominator, you have this term squared plus this term squared. So 225 plus 100 will give us 325. Um, so J with J will give us minus sign. And you have here a minus sign that become plus. So 150 by 10 will give us 1500. This is positive. Minus 150 G by 15 will give us minus J 2250. If you divide this one, these two by 325, you obtain this impedance Z1. Now, this, this Z1 is in series with ZL in series with this 10 ohm resistor so by combining all all of them I now can calculate the input impedance of the circuit Zn and from that I can calculate the input current so this is what I did here I um, I now will calculate Zn so Zn here is equal to Z1 plus J omega L plus 10 so it is 10 plus J5 this is J omega L and this is it one we calculated earlier. Sum the real plus the real, you get 14.615. Sum imaginary plus imaginary, this is minus 6.923. And this is 5, you get minus G, 1.923. So we calculate the input impedance. Now we're going to calculate the input current. 
or the current drone from the source and uh, don't be confused if I bought a tilde or don't bought a tilde I still mean a phaser IS here will be VS over ZN so the total input impedance ZN and this is VS this is one this was the source was 100 cosine 100 T so it's a phaser whose amplitude is 100 whose angle is 0 ZN is this term okay so uh, to divide two complex numbers one way of doing it to find the polar form of this one so the polar form the square root of this square plus this squared this gives us this modulus and the angle is the inverse tangent of minus 9.23 divided by 15.615 it gives us this one okay so uh, of course this angle is going to be negative because we are here in the fourth quadrant and it's going to be small as well because the imaginary part as a, as a modulus is way less than the real part and the angle is indeed only minus 7.49 degrees so this moves to the numerator you subtract 0 minus 7 minus minus 7.49 you end up with 7.49 divide the modulus by the modulus you get 6.784 so now we know that this is this is the phase of the voltage amplitude 100 angle 0 so this is AV and this is theta v. This is a phase of the current drawn from the source, amplitude 6.785, so this is ai, and this is theta i. We know that the average power is the product of the two amplitudes divided by 2, multiplying cosine theta v minus theta i. Theta v is 0, theta i is 7.49, but the cosine is an even function, so this negative sign would not make any difference. So if you multiply the two amplitudes divide by two and then multiply by this cosine which will be very close to one you obtain 334.8 watts so this power where does this power go this power actually is delivered to the resistors in the circuit and if you calculate the average power delivered to these two resistors you will see that the, their sum the sum for the two resistors will give us 334.8 watts so this power does not have anything to do with the inductor or the capacitor because the average power for the inductor and the capacitor are zero, are zeros. Okay, let's take a look at one example. This example is, is a little bit more detailed because I would like to calculate the average power supplied by this source. And I would like also to know the average power dissipated in the one ohm and the two ohm resistors. Uh, so we'll try to do both calculations and see what we're going to get. So the way I did this question, again, here they did not give me the frequency because you already calculated for us what is 1 over j omega c, what is j omega l. This calculation is already made for us, so we don't really need to know the frequency here. So, what we're going to do, we'll try to find the total input impedance. So we have this branch in parallel with this branch. This will give us an impedance Z1, and then this one here will be in series with J2, this will give us a total input impedance. When we know the total input impedance, then the current drawn from the source is this source divided by the total input impedance. Okay, so this impedance here is 1 minus G1. Okay, so this is what I call Z1 here. I call this parallel combination Z2. So Z2 is equal to 2 in parallel with Z1. So it's 2 multiplied by Y minus G1 over 2 plus 1 minus g1 so the numerator will give me here 3 minus j I multiplied by the conjugate of this denominator the denominator gave me 3 minus j I multiplied by 3 plus j over 3 plus j so the product here will give me square of this one plus square of this one so it's 9 plus 1 will give us 10 in the numerator we will get 2 reals and 2 imaginary uh, 6 we get 6 here 6 plus 2, so you get 8 real. This is minus J6 plus J2, so you get minus J4. If you divide these two by 10 in the denominator, you obtain this impedance Z2. Then the, this barrel combination here, this barrel combination is what I called here Z2. Okay? So the total input impedance seen by the source is equal to Z2 in series with J2. And this is what I wrote here. Zn is equal to J2 plus Z2. So what I did here, I added, I'm going to add J2 to this term. So this still remains 0.8. And this is minus G.4. You add to that J2, 
So you obtain J1.6 ohm. So this is the total input impedance. The next step in our calculations to find the total current drawn by the source, drawn from the source. So this current here, IS tilde. This is a phasor we're looking for. Okay, because we'll use that phasor and the phasor of the voltage to calculate the average power delivered by the source. Okay, so th this current here is nothing but the phasor of the source divided by the input impedance. The phasor of the source is 6 angle 0. The input impedance we calculated before is 0.8 plus G1.6, and this is what we use here. We do this division and we have the current. So I did that, so um, I converted the, uh, the term in the denominator to mo modulus and angle. Um, the angle of the numerator here is zero because it's purely real. So six over 1.7889 gives us this term and zero minus 63 will give us minus 63.43. Okay, and if you write this one, this in polar form, if you write it in Cartesian form or rectangular form, you get 1.5 minus J3 exact. So it numbers are actually well behaved for the rectangular form. So I, 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 I will need the currents flowing in this branch and this branch to calculate the power, the average power delivered to the one ohm resistor and the two ohm resistor. Okay, so I used here the current division expression. So the current I1 is equal to the current IS multiplying 2 over 2 plus 1 minus G1. So these are two branches in parallel. Then the current I1 is equal to the total current multiplying this impedance over this impedance plus this impedance. And this is what I did here. Okay. So um, IS is, we already calculated IS. We already calculated IS before. It is, um, is 1.4 minus G3. Okay. Um, and uh, I multiply that by 2 and then I divide over 3 minus J. Okay, I, I, did, the, I did the result here directly. I did it as a, in a piece of paper outside. And then I uh, substituted here. It's 1.5 minus G1.5 exact. Okay, but this is a total current and this is I1. I need to get to I2. If you compare this one and this one, you will see that I2 is nothing my, but minus G1.5. Because if you add to this term minus G1.5, you get this one. So this is here is I2. Now we start to calculate the average power. We have three average powers to calculate here in this question. The average power delivered by the source. The average power dissipated in the first res in the resistor 1 ohm. And the average power dissipated in the uh, 2 ohm resistor. So let's talk about first the one delivered by the source. I know the amplitude of the source. It is 6. I know the amplitude of the current, of the current delivered or supplied by the source, it is 3.354. And I know the angle of the, of the source voltage is zero. I know the angle of the current theta i, it is minus 63.43. So I know everything that I need to calculate the average power supplied by the source. I call it here VAV source. So you do this um, multiplication here, 6 multiplied by 3. Uh, this is AV, this is AI, divided by 2, cosine theta V minus C theta I. Remember, theta I is negative. If you do this product, you get exactly 4.5 watts. Okay, now let's calculate the power delivered to the, to the 1 ohm resistor. Remember that we have a 1 ohm resistor here. Okay, if you have the 1 ohm resistor, and there is a current I1 flowing through it. The voltage, the voltage across the resistor is equal to 1 ohm multiplying I1 okay remember the voltage and current will be in phase so cosine theta V uh, theta V is equal to theta I then the cosine is 1 then I can simply say that the power for the for the 1 ohm resistor is the amplitude of the voltage multiplying amplitude of the current divided by 2 but remember because V is equal to I R the amplitude of the voltage is nothing but the amplitude of the current multiplying R. So I can simply replace V1 by I1R. So this becomes 1 half I1 squared R1. I already calculated I1. I, I know it's amplitude. I can get it. It's 2.123. R1 is 1 ohm. I divide by 1 half. You get exactly 2.25 watts. 
we repeat the same thing exactly for the second resistor, for the 2 ohm resistor. He said that the average power is the amplitude of the voltage multiplying amplitude of the current divided by 2. But remember the amplitude of the voltage is equal to amplitude of the current multiplying R. So remember this current was minus G1.5. So its amplitude is 1.5 and the phase is 9, 9 minus 90 degrees is really irrelevant here because the voltage will have exactly the same phase. So I squared 1.5, okay, and then I multiply by the value of the resistor, so it's 2, and then I divide it by 2. You get exactly 2.25. Something very interesting that you, you must notice, that the average power supplied by the source is equal to the average power dissipated in the first resistor, plus the average power dissipated in the second resistor. This is not a coincidence, because the average power supplied by the source goes, dis dissipates into the, resist the resistors of the network, while the inductors and the capacitors, they do not dissipate any power. They are actually lossless components. They store energy, and then you give the same energy back. Of course, we talk here about ideal inductors and ideal capacitors. Uh, true inductors and capacitors will have some losses. Okay, the last thing I would like to mention in this part is the concept of maximum like maximum power transfer. We have seen in resistive networks to get the maximum power, you must have the resistance of the load equal to the resistance of the Thevenin equivalent seen from the load side. Here we have something a little bit interesting here. If you have, um, if you build the Thevenin equivalent, looking from the side of any complex load ZL, then it can be shown, and there is there is derivation for that in the textbook if you want to read it, that to get maximum power, maximum average power delivered from this source to this load, you have to make ZL equal to the conjugate of Z7. Conjugate means it has the same real part, but it has the negative of the imaginary part. So if this is Z7, this is how the load should look like for maximum power transfer. And this con co concept or this, uh, or this condition is called the conjugate, uh, conjugate matching, uh, is widely used in electrical engineering. Uh, ha different High frequency circuits require the same thing. Uh, it's it's you find it everywhere where there is uh, alternating current or alternating voltage. Voltage change with time sinusoidally. Uh, you find that this condition must hold. Okay, so to get maximum power transfer from the source to the load, you must have the load equal to the conjugate of the Thevenin impedance. Let's take a look at one example illustrating how we can get this ZL for maximum power transfer. We have here a circuit. We have a sinusoidal source, six angle zero, so it's six cosine omega t. And I uh, would like to know what, what is the value of ZL for maximum power transfer and what is the value of this maximum power. And when we talk about maximum power, we really mean maximum average power, okay? Because the power really, uh, in this case, is everything is sin is is it's changing sinusoidal, but the, the power will have an average, a non-zero average. Okay, so we'd like to get maximum average power transfer. Okay, what we're gonna do here, we're gonna start to build a seven equivalent. So looking between these two terminals, we're gonna remove ZL, and we'll try to find the seven equivalent between between these two terms. First, to find that Z seven. And we'll find it by eliminating all the independent sources. Uh, so this one will be shorted out. And then we'll try to find the input impedance seen between these two terminals. So this is what I did here. I, I removed the independent source. I made it short circuit. I removed the load. And now my target is to find the input impedance looking into the side. Some, unfortunately, will, will get fooled and will say, well, this shorts the 2 ohm and the G1, but if someone says that, I will ask him, okay, find for me one component where this short circuit is in barrel with it. You will not find any. It's not in barrel with G1 because this node is not connected to the other side short circuit. It, it, it also does not short G2 because G2 is, is this 2 ohm, because it's co 2 ohm is connected to one node, but this node is not connected to the short circuit. So what's gonna happen here is that this short circuit connect this point to this point. So G1 and 2 ohm are now in parallel because they share this common node and they share also this common node. One other thing, because this node and this node are now in parallel, this impedance and this impedance are now in parallel. 
okay so I redrew the circuit and this is how the circuit looks like as, as if I took this one and I folded it back so J1 is in parallel now is to ohm because he shared this node and he shared this node 1 ohm is in parallel with J1 because they share this node and they share the bottom node okay so this is really how the circuit looks like so the Thevenin equivalent is 2 ohm in parallel with G1 in series when we was one with 1 ohm in parallel with minus G1 so this is what I wrote here 2 ohm in parallel with G1 in series with 1 ohm in parallel with uh, minus G okay so don't, don't this not 1 minus G it's in parallel with minus G so this one here give me give me 2J over 2 plus J this one here will give me minus J over 1 minus J okay so um, I multiply by the conjugate of this one I get 2 minus J in the numerator and the denominator becomes 5 I multiply by the conjugate of this one so I get 1 plus J and the denominator becomes 2 um, so if you multi if you collect all the rare terms so this here will give us 2 over 5 so this is point, uh, point, 2 over 5 is point 0.4 and this one here will give us 1 half so point 0.4 plus 1 half will give us point 0.9 let's now talk about the imaginary part 4g over 5 will give us point 0.8g and I have minus 1 half j so minus point 0.5j so we get plus j, j point 0.3 here so this seven equivalent Thevenin resistance is 0.9 minus J0.3. So for maximum power transfer, the load the load impedance must be 0.9 minus J0.3. Must be the conjugate of this term. Okay, meaning it has the same real part but has the opposite imaginary part. The sign of the imaginary part has to change. Now to calculate the power, we have to find the Thevenin voltage. We find the Thevenin voltage by creating an open circuit, leaving the independent sources as they are, and then we try to solve them. Of course, you could have uh, done something like loop analysis, maybe you have one loop, a second loop, or you have done something like nodal analysis, maybe one node, a second node, you can do all this, but the circuit is actually way simpler than that, because these two are in series, and these two are in series, okay? So the voltage I'm measuring here is the voltage across the two ohm resistor, minus the voltage across this capacitor okay so I have here a voltage divider between J1 and 2 because these two are in series and both of them has this 6 angle 0 in parallel and I have here another voltage divider okay between the 1 ohm and the minus J so I can I can know the, the voltage between here and here and I can know the voltage between here and here the voltage between here and here is equal to 6 multiplying 2 over 2 plus plus G1 the voltage between here and here is equal to 6 multiplying minus J over minus J plus 1 so this is what you have here okay uh, if you multiply by the conjugate of course I, I, I simplify things by multiplying by the conjugate I multiply by the conjugate this one you get 2 minus J the denominator becomes 2 squared plus 1 squared, so you get 5. I, I multiply by the conjugate of this one, which is 1 plus j. So this why I have this one here. And the denominator will contain 2. Um, I summed all the uh, real parts together and all the imaginary parts together. So um, it's not that difficult to see. This one is going to give me 24 over 5. 24 over 5 is 4.8. This one will give me minus 6 over 2, minus 3. So 4.8 minus 3 will give you 1.8. Okay, let's talk about the imaginary part now. Minus 12J over 5 will give you minus 2.4J. And this one here will give us 3J. So minus 2.4J plus 3J, you get 0.6J. So this is the open circuit voltage, 7 open circuit voltage. And of course, in order to calculate... Um, the uh, the uh, the uh, power I have to now draw the Thevenin circuit and connect the load to it given the condition that the load now is equal to the conjugate of the Thevenin impedance
So I, I redrew the circuit right now. This is Z7. The load now is the conjugate of this 7 This is what the star, what the star means. When you add one, one complex number and its conjugate, then the sum will give you two multiplying the real part. Okay? Because the two imaginary parts will cancel out. They have opposite signs. So here the current the current sees up a real impedance. So looking into the circuit from this side, I see a real impedance. Why a real impedance? Because th these two are conjugate to one another. If the, the imaginary part is positive, the imaginary part here have the same magnitude but it's negative. So they cancel each other out and they are left only by two multiplying the real part. We already calculated the real part of Z7, it was 0.9. This multiplying 2.9, and we calculated V7 is this one. So I'm now able to obtain I, I th this is a current drawn in this circuit, and its modulus is 1.044. We know what is the value of the supplied power by the source. The supplied power by the source is equal to 1 half Vs Is over 2. Remember, this is resistive case because the, the current and the voltage have the same angle. This is V7 and this is I. You both have the same angle. Why? Because the sum of these two is real. Then the total impedance is real. Okay? This is why the cosine here, cosine theta V minus theta I, will give us 1 because theta V is equal to theta I. So I know what is the amplitude of the voltage. I, can, I, I got that from the previous slide. It's the modulus of this term here. It's 1.8974. I calculated the modulus of the current. 1.044 and then divide that by 2. But remember, only half of this power will be delivered to the load because half of it will be dissipated in the real part of the uh, 7 resistance. So you have two, res this is say 5 plus J3, this is 5 minus J3. This one has 5 ohm, this one has 5 ohm. So half the power will go from the source and this is why I have to multiply by another one half. Because I'm getting here the average power delivered to the load. Okay? But the average power supplied by the source is this term without the one half. Okay? So if you multiply them, you divide by this term, you obtain 0.5 watts. So in this circuit, the maximum power that could be transferred from the source to the load, maximum average power, is equal to 0.5 watts. I want you to remember that these two are con conjugate to one another. So when you sum them, you get a real resistance. So look, real impedance. So looking into the circuit, the load sees a resistance, effectively a resistance. And this is why I did not need to include the cosine part, because the the voltage here, the thevenin voltage, and the current I tilde, they are in phase. Okay. So I was able to calculate the average power, and remember, the power supplied by the source is divided equally, the average power supplied by the source, into the power dissipated in the resistive part of this 7 resistance and the power dissipated into the resistive part of the load.